Grace and peace to you this morning. We're glad that you're here. It's nice to have Angela visiting with us from the Commonwealth of Virginia, a good friend of ours. She and Kim are best friends, and uh, she's here to spend a little time. You might have met her before. She's been here a couple times, right? From the Cold Harbor Road Church, where we were, as Brother Bill Burton would say, the Cold Harbor Road Church in, uh, in, in Virginia. So welcome to you wherever you are and from whatever time you're joining us. Uh, glad for those who are watching. Sometimes a f only a few, but sometimes uh, these uh, recordings, these uploads will, will have a lot of views. But whether few or many, we hope this can be useful to other people as well who can watch later. So, but to let you know, this is my segue for, uh, to, to let you know what we're experiencing today uh, Wednesday night, I mentioned that winter was coming. Yes, winter was coming to the Gulf Coast. Angela, this is winter here. This is, yeah, I mean, people just, uh, they start their fireplaces and, yeah. Yeah, probably cancel school. <laughs> Wednesday night, Wednesday night, we talked about how we were going to build snowmen and, uh, you know, we were going to go ice skating, play hockey, all those things. All right. But I'm just excited that it's sweater weather and we can wear our sweatshirts and sweaters, sweaters, I, <laughs> sweaters, sweat, I just made a new portmanteau, a combined word there. Um, no, we'll have to vote on it. Sweater. Uh, I saw a little funny I wanted to share with you because, uh, well, let me tell you why. Uh, I shared this with Kim and Angela. Angela has uh, 38 cats at her house, right? How many cats do you have? She, she has a lot of cats, okay, so she's our cat lady. But uh, when I saw that, and the reason I'm sharing that with you is it, it reminded me of the stuff we used to text with Jim. We would send, you know, with Brother Hicks, we'd send funny little things like that back and forth. I know Kim and Anna do that. Sometimes we share humorous stuff and a lot of cat videos and such, everything like, such as... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm going to kill the lights for just a second for the, for the final introductory thing here before we actually study the Bible. We'll leave time to study the Bible, Rose. Erwin but. just dislikes cats. And would you believe the other day he brought a stray cat home? He brought a little kitten home? I think something's wrong with him. Yeah, well, that's pro we, we know there's something wrong with Erwin, but... Uh, yeah, when he brought a cat home, but, he does not like cats. All right, oh good, we still have a couple folks coming in. Um, yeah, and he tried to give that cat to us, and Kim asked me if we could have that cat. And I said if we had servants, if we had a nice big mansion with servants who took care of everything, who did all the cleaning, who did all the litter box stuff, and, uh, you know, took, took our animals to the vets and took care of all that, then maybe I would love to have dogs and cats, but I don't, I don't, there's no animal I love enough. When I look at my neighbors, People walking around, I might have said this before. There, there's no animal I love enough to, to follow it around the neighborhood with a plastic bag and pick up, <laughs> and pick up its doo-doo and carry it around back to my house. I mean, you have to, you have to be some kind of crazy. Some of you do that? Do you have dogs in a neighborhood where you have to clean up after your dog? Well, all right, I wanted to show you, since Angela's here, these are pics I took when we lived in Mechanicsville, Virginia, back, this is near Walmart, this is a street near Walmart, on the, it's just off the main drag there in Mechanicsville, and this tree just jumped out at me. I, this was in 2014, and I absolutely was awed, and I spent some time praising God for this tree, and uh, just enjoying it. Uh, thankfully, the neighbors didn't come out and shoot me or call the police, but I was in the yard. I walked up and took some close pictures of it. I took a lot of pictures of it. And I used to, what I would do is I'd gather leaves when we were up there and arrange them on our deck and take pictures of them, individual leaves. Aren't they gorgeous? I just thought you'd enjoy that. And I love when the outer tips start to turn and the inside of the leaf is still uh, green. That's one leaf. No. The, uh, no. Oh, sorry. This. Yeah. Just the one in the middle. Yeah. 
and it's on top of some yellow ones for contrast there, and then this one too. So the Lord has revealed his beauty to us in, in wonderful ways. I couldn't imagine living in the tropics where it's always hot and humid and where you never have any, any fall experience at all. I mean, at least we do get a little cool weather and have a little bit of a change of seasons here. Right. So, I mean, the fact that the, 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 the area around the equator has so many palm trees, that, that was the Lord's way of discouraging us from living there. It's not the... <laughs> Well, when you come in, could you, could you close the door? Kathy, would you mind? I'm sorry, I know you look all comfy in that little seat there. I'm making you get up. We'll ask uh, for the Lord's blessings on us as we go to his word. Oh, great God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Holy Father, we praise you for your mercy. Thank you for granting us another day that we don't deserve we know our blessings are beyond measure, Lord. They're too many for us to number. They're too great for us to measure, Lord. You've lavished your goodness upon us in myriads of ways. We could never begin to count all of our blessings, but we ask for you to, to deepen in us an appreciation for every good thing that we have, for we know all that we have dear God, is because of your grace, and including this opportunity to, to be your children, to gather this way on this Lord's Day, to study your word, to have your word, and to be able to study it like this, and to be able to worship you freely and draw near to your, your holy presence through your Son. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for our teachers and our children. Bless them and your faithful servants, wherever they may be, O oh God, and especially we ask comfort for Beverly, those grieving in the loss of our brother Jim. We're so thankful to know that he's present with you and rejoicing this day and that you give us that same joy and that same hope in Christ. May that work in us, Father. May that draw us ever near to you. And may we hold forth the light of your gospel so that others might have that same hope, that same joy that you give us in Jesus our Lord. And it's in his name, Father, we offer you our thanks and our praise and ask for your blessings. Amen. Okay. I, I mentioned these memory verses or key passages that I suggest you memorize. And e Elaine asked me for a list of them that I texted to her. If you want those, I can give them to you. Remember, everything you see on the boards is available at the link in the video description uh, on YouTube, but we'll hopefully we're going to get to one of the first ones there. I'll just keep reminding you of those as we go. So after five introductory classes, we're, we're actually looking at the text. What? What? Did I say something funny? Did I miss something? Oh, okay. You just thought of something funny, right? <laughs> and busted out laughing. Chapters, uh, chapters one through four, really, this is a unit at the beginning of the letter where Paul deals with the vision in the church, we'll see. But first, we're looking at his opening and his thanksgiving that's customary. We talked about the elements of the Pauline letters, the form that he follows. We started that opening in the, with the salutation, with the address, and, the, and then we get into the thanksgiving here at the beginning. But then we'll see how uh, this idea of division and unity, how this occupies his attention over the next several chapters, it shows the importance of it, that, that he devotes so much to it. So you remember we started reading the text, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. And so much there we said uh, we don't want to just rush by that, but uh, hurriedly at the end of class, I mentioned how many times he, he, he refers to being uh, called or our calling. You see, when, when you see something over and over like that, then it, it's something we need to pay attention to. It's obviously, it's, it's an emphasis here. So we'll note that as we go and talk a little bit more 
uh, about that. And so we looked through that, uh, that first verse and part of the second verse there uh, because we'd still had some introductory stuff to look at last time so we didn't get too far into, into the text. But he's addressing God's church, his ecclesia, the called out, the, 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 the etymology of the, the, the root word or the terms from which uh, it, it is made, the, the word ecclesia, the, those that are called out. We're, we'll see that, but you see that how he's speaking of how he was called to be an apostle and we're called by the will of God. And so there's a sense in which you can think of our identity as the church, as the people of God, uh, we're, we're the God's called out people. Hold all my calls, Don, or uh, wait, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to tease you about that. I know, I know. I get in a panic when my phone goes off when, uh, you find the right button. and you can't find the button, right? No. Right? Right? And um, I noticed the frequency with which that happens increases proportionally to a person's age, right? So the older you are, the more likely your phone is going to go off, and the less likely you'll be able to find the button, the button. that silences it. <laughs> so I think you can read between the lines there. Don is one of these old guys that doesn't know how to work his phone. No, he does. No. Um, well, uh, Les isn't with us this morning either. So, so notice, uh, I want to focus in. We said in these openings to the letter, we want to pay attention because a lot of times we get hints of what is going to come in the letter. There'll be key terms or there'll be references to themes that will then be developed in the rest of the letter. And you're going to see this idea of being holy or being sanctified, being saints. He said to the church of God that's in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be, there's that word again, sanctified, called to be saints. Now this, we often point this out. We have this group of words for this tremendously important concept for, for us in the way that we think of ourselves, the way that God wants us to think of who we are. Uh, you have um, hagiadso is the, is the noun, sanctified. Uh, the, um, I'm sorry, the verb, the verb, to, to sanctify, to sanctify. Hagiatsu, so you hear, you hear the, the, the same sound or the same root term in the word saint. That's from the Greek hagiasmos. So hagiazo, hagiasmos, you can hear the, the same, you can see in the spelling. I put the English spelling there as well. And that can just mean uh, it can be an adjective or it can be used as a substantive, right? Where you have an adjective used as a, as a noun, like uh, the, the, my favorite example of that is the title of the Clint Eastwood film. The good, the bad, yeah, and the ugly. See, those are adjectives, but they're used substantively for people, good people, bad people, the ugly, ugly people. Uh, so um, it can mean can be an adjective to, to describe something like a holy God. Um, and it can just mean the holy one or a holy one. Or a, and that's the word for saint, or that's where we get uh, the English word saint. It's a translation of that. And then the noun hagios, uh, sanctification, or that can be translated consecration, to set something apart, to consecrate something. Or it can just be translated holiness, where to pursue sanctification. There's a sanctification we get when we become Christians. We're cleansed of our sin. We're made holy. We're set apart by God. That's the basic idea, is to be set apart for God. Not just set apart, but set apart for a purpose. We're consecrated to God. And it can mean as well to be in, in the sense of God, only God is holy. Um, you have that affirmation made in scripture. He is, you have the, the taken to the superlative and the, the, the he, uh, heavenly beings praising God in Isaiah six, the, the hagios, the, the holy, holy, holy. In, in the ultimate sense, only God is perfect or perfectly pure, but we're called to be separate from sin. That idea of moral purity is in the word as well. But so there's a, there's a holiness, there's a sanctification that happens 
Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 6, you have been sanctified. So it's something that has occurred, but then there's a sanctification we're, we're to pursue, that we're to continue to strive to be holy, to live holy. So it's important because Paul's going to stress this is a problem with their tolerating the sin, the, the brother in their midst who is openly practicing sexual immorality, and we'll see some other problems where he has to remind them that this, the, the idea that sexual immorality was perfectly acceptable. He addresses that in chapter 6. He says, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we're to be holy, right? So the idea you see in Scripture, and you take the whole context of Scripture, the theology of this idea of God's holy ones, God's holy people, we're set apart to be his, to belong to him, right? Uh, at the end of the chapter, we've been called to be his. Uh, in, in chapter 1 and verse 30, he's made us to be his righteousness, sanctification and, and, and redemption at the very end of the chapter. Uh, in verse 30, and in chapter 6, 19 and 20, we were bought with a price. So we belong to God. He has purchased us to be his is the idea. You see that in, with Israel in the, the Old Testament, in the Mosaic dispensation, God separated Israel from the nations. He said, you'll, uh, Exodus 19, 6, if you obey my voice indeed, you shall be my treasured possession from among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a holy nation. Peter uses that language in 1 Peter 2 of the church. We're the people that are God's treasured possessions, set apart, sanctified from all the nations. You should be holy, Leviticus 19, 2. For, for the Lord your God is holy. Peter quotes that in 1 Peter 1 about us. In, in the second letter, or it's really the fourth letter that he wrote to the saints in Corinth. Paul says, be separate, come out from them, touch no unclean thing. And then in chapter 7, verse 1, he says, having therefore these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. The idea of this, that's another metaphor of that we're to be separate from sin because we are these holy ones. So we're to cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the sight of God. That, he uses that word here. Um, that particular form of the word there. So that will be very important as we proceed. We'll see it. So we said you get hints of these things right from the start. He wants them already to be thinking of themselves in these terms because there are problems in the church at Corinth with sexual immorality. And that's where holiness is often stressed the most when being cleansed or being pure from sin often uh, the, the, the emphasis is to be sexually pure. For example, 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul said, this is the will of God, your, your sanctification that you abstain from sexual immorality. That's the connection typically made. So that's where we'll see things going in the letter. Notice, too, he says, he says you, you've been set apart, you've been made saints, or these holy ones. He says... Um, called to be saints together, together with all those in every, with all of those in every place. All right, so we belong to all of the Lord's people. And you'll see that several times in the letter. So in other words, Paul wants them to think bigger than their group in Corinth. The house churches in Corinth that made up the church, the church of God in the city. But they need to realize, we need to realize we're part of a much bigger family, a much bigger body. And that uh, we, we, with all of those who are saints in every place, we belong to that community. And so several times in the letter, Paul will say, what I'm telling you, I teach everywhere in every church. Or he'll say, so I ordain in all the churches. So we have this uniformity, this acceptance of fundamental teaching that unites us, that we hold in common, and that is to be in every church. We'll see that all places, everywhere, in every church who call, notice he says, on the name, then he says, on the name of our Lord Jesus. I just want you to notice, because he's about to address the factions, some are saying, well, I belong to Paul, and I belong to Apollos. And I think he's stressing here, 
It's the Lord we belong to, not any man. It's the Lord we follow, not any person, because notice how many times in a short space. I, I know you can't really read the text that well there. Um, maybe you can. It's not uh, too large there. But notice, notice how many times he'll say, the Lord Jesus, our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Lord, our Lord, our Lord. He, you know, he said their Lord and ours. It's not my Lord. It's our, it's our Lord. If he's my Lord and he's your Lord, you see them, it's, he's our Lord. So notice at the beginning of the letter, you can see in those green highlights how many times he appeals to the name of Jesus. To, and I think that's a part of the unity that he's stressing. So then he says, let me, let me bring these back in here. Uh, then he says this. You notice that's how I started class today for a reason. Uh, grace and peace to you. Grace and, and peace. So it was typical to extend a greeting at the beginning of a letter uh, in the ancient world. And Paul is following standard conventions of letter writing. We said it's a letter. And it's a letter that was followed forms that were common at that time. But then we see things that are distinctive. And one of the things that many think Paul is doing here is he's adapting that. He's Christianizing sort of the, the, the word for greeting is similar to the word grace. But instead of Paul using that word, I think it's karain. I, I'm, I'll put it on the screen here for those of you watching later at home. Uh, but he uses charis. The word for grace, grace. And so in other words, he's putting an emphasis on on the standard greeting. He's putting a Christian perspective on the standard greeting. Grace and peace. Peace. Um, some would say you see the Greek, the standard sort of Gentile or Greek greeting with grace. And then Paul, of course, in his Jewish heritage is thinking of uh, it's common to say shalom, the Hebrew word for peace. But that, remember we said that's a very rich concept. It doesn't just mean absence of conflict. It doesn't just mean absence of hostility. It's the idea of your, your whole life being in harmony, all the parts of your life being in, in harmony. I think of many times when I'm praying for people who are struggling. It might be they're struggling spiritually or physically. Sometimes it's mentally and you want that person to have peace. And so a lot of times I'll ask the Lord to bless someone in mind and body and soul, both mind, body and soul. But you think of your whole life being at, in harmony or being, being at peace. And I also like the idea that our Christian experience begins with grace. It's because of God's grace, because of God's favor. We're in Christ Jesus. We're in relationship to God. And the end of that is the consummation of it. The result of it is peace. So the beginning and end of the Christian experience, grace and peace is a beautiful way to speak to each other. I know a couple of preachers who use that greeting when they get up in the pulpit. And that seems odd to us, I think. We don't do that as much today. We don't greet each other with, with kind of a well, with a benediction or some kind of formal or ritualistic expression like that, what do we usually, how do we usually greet each other? Hey. hey. Or, you know, I like doing this when I go into like a convenience store or Bucky's or something. Oh, I was going to show my Bucky's Sours. I, I was going to point out that how today's class is brought to you by Bucky's, a new product I got at Bucky's that, uh, yeah, I'm advertising for Bucky's now. I got a sponsor, uh, Rose. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll show it. It's in my bag over there. I don't want to walk over and get it. But, um, but uh, now what, what were we saying? Oh, so I like when I'm somewhere, people don't know me. And I'll say hello and I'll say, hi, how you doing? How you doing? And I'll make them think I'm like from Jersey or, Jersey or something like that. How you doing? No, how you doing? Um, but a lot of times people, that's what they'll say. They'll ask you how you're doing. They don't really want to know or they don't really want you to answer. It's just a politeness, right? How you doing? Well, if you start telling them all about how you're doing, say, well, I'm just saying hello, okay? But, um, but uh, how, how are you doing or how are you? Uh, but can you imagine if we saw each other and we gave each other a holy kiss and then we said, grace and peace to you, Rose? You know, that would be beautiful, right? But also be weird to, to us. So, uh, but... Uh, in our context, but 
it's, uh, and then he says from, from, and so Paul could say this as an apostle. He's extending this from, from God. He's our father. This is the way we think of God, the fatherhood of God and the lordship of Jesus Christ. Who is God and who is Jesus to us? God is father. Jesus is Lord. See how much theology is just in those brief few verses. Now watch this, watch this. Is it, it's, it's a little too warm in here now, isn't it? You know, we didn't want to put on the heat. That would have been brutal. But uh, now, is it just me? I'm burning up. Anyone have a question or comment so far so I can take a sip? Wait, wait, one at a time, because it's confusing when everybody, when everybody speaks all at once, it's very confusing. Confusifying. Well... All right, so I give thanks. Now, Paul typically will start. What's the one letter where he doesn't? He's got nothing good to say at the beginning of one of his, uh, <laughs> to, to the church, in one of his letters. That it's the harshest of Paul's letters where he just jumps on them immediately, starts rebuking them. It's Galatians, right? It's Galatians, which we think is the very first letter he wrote. But in all of Paul's other letters, you have this thanksgiving. He expresses thanks. But I want you to think about what's the difference in the thanks he's expressing here compared to what he does in other letters. And the difference is because of the situation with this church in Corinth. So he says, I give thanks to my God always for you. And so thanksgiving, give in everything, give thanks, right? Giving thanks always, that's uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always for all things. So Paul himself, not only, not only did he command that, he exemplified that. You can see how his prayers were absolutely saturated with thanksgiving for his brothers and sisters for so many things. But he says, I give thanks to my God always for you. For what? Because of the grace that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you're not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Oh, wow, a lot there. Look, I already got through nine verses. Uh, Richard, are you, are you amazed? Yeah, well, it's going to take us three weeks to cover these nine verses. But no, no, we're going to, let, let, let's look at it here. No, I want you to think of the difference. I've got a few of them. I'm going to pull up some of these to show you the difference between what he says. I just listed those for reference. Those who want to look at those and uh, other greetings in more detail. But what's interesting, what's interesting here is unlike in Paul's other letters, he omits any reference to what does he usually thank God for when he writes to the churches? If I didn't know better, I would think that that was Robert Moore who came in and, and sitting in the back. That's not, you're not Robert Moore, are you? Yes. No. Oh, all right. Sorry. I was going to say, Kim, Robert is here. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, you belong to, uh, uh, what? I know, what? I know, it's going to come to me. I know your name. I'm sorry. I asked you twice and I, I don't want to ask you again. So uh, somebody help me. Somebody text me their names while I'm talking. What, what are they usually, um, what, are they, what does he usually thank God for? He'll, he'll speak of their love. I want to thank God for the love that you have. And he'll speak, I know those are a little bit hard to see, but um, especially down here at the bottom of the slides for depending on where you're sitting. But um, he, he'll, he'll thank them for their, their love. And typically he thanks them, you see in these other passages, for their labor, for their work for the Lord. He doesn't do that with the Corinthians. Look at the difference between what he says here. What is he thanking? What is he thanking? What is he giving thanks for here? Anything about them? It's about what 
what God has done, right? It's not about what they've done and their love and their work like he usually does. He says, you know what I'm thankful for when I think of you? All the stuff that God has given you, all the stuff that God has done for you, because this is a church with a lot of problems and Paul's going to be correcting them on a lot of things. And so he doesn't say, oh, I'm so thankful for your love and your work and your unity. He's about to take them to task and break down all these issues and problems they're having. So his thanks is about, oh, I'm thankful what God has done, what God has done for you. Now, compare that, say, for example, look at, ah, uh, how do I, I'm at to pull that off because I did that in the wrong order. So notice uh, he says, in, for example, in Romans, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith. So he's commending them for their faith. And uh, look, look what he says um, in verse 10. I make mention of you always. He says similar things, always in my prayers. Uh, look at Ephesians 1. Sorry. He says, um, uh, because of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my, my prayers. Then Philippians 1, his very personal letter, his, his letter of joy, brimming with so much joy. I thank my God and all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you making my prayer with joy because, and then he talks about how they helped him. He, uh, he talks about how they helped him in the gospel, your partnership in the gospel. And then in Colossians 1, he says, notice, um, since verse 4, we pray for you, the end of verse 3, verse 4, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. So again, he mentions their faith and the love that you have for all of the saints. First Thessalonians, we give thanks always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before God our Father, your work of faith, your labor of love, your steadfast of hope. Look at that triad there, beautiful uh, rhetoric that Paul's using in our Lord Jesus. For we know, brothers, loved by God that he has chosen you. So th then look at 2 Thessalonians. We ought to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. He does not say anything like that about the church in Corinth. Not that they're terrible Christians, but it's a much different emphasis we'll see in the letter. Like in 2 Timothy, I thank my God whom I serve. He tells Timothy, verse 4, I remember your tears. He, men he mentions his prayers night and day, and I remember your tears. I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith. So again, he's always thanking them and praising them. Let me bring that back in. So he admits these references to their... Um, any references to, to any of their faithfulness, right? Does that make sense then? You see how the point is, it's what God has done, what God has given them. He's given these gifts to them. You see? Well, it's because as we, in all those introductory lessons, we pointed out, this is a different situation here. See, the background, when we understand, having surveyed the letter, we understand what, what the situation was there why there's a different emphasis even in the thanksgiving at the beginning. So what does he talk about that they had been given? By the grace that was given to you. And that grace, he says, enriched them. All right, this grace enriched you. And, and, and grace can just mean any favor, any good thing that God gives. Not necessarily just saving grace, forgiveness of sins in Christ. And here he's talking about what things does he mention. He mentions speech. Uh, your, your Bible might say word. Whoops. I want, I want. Yeah. Speech and knowledge. Uh, logos and gnosis. Right? Word. The logos is the same word for word. I want to see if I can do this. I've done this a couple of times. Where can you see where I have a couple little tiny things written there? Can you see the little words logos and knowledge? All right, watch. Isn't that cool? Isn't that neat? You you are so unimpressed with the cool stuff I show you about my about my presentation. I, I've never encountered such appalling, appalling indifference. Wait, now I can't get it back. I gotta get it back. Wait. There. <laughs> All right, so 
Uh, all right, the, what are these things? What are these things? Well, later in the letter, he's going to devote quite a bit of space to talking about the gifts, the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit they had that allowed them to speak the word, to have a knowledge. Remember, they, could, they didn't have the completed New Testament, the books of the New Testament. They didn't have the New Testament scriptures yet completed and circulated and collected. And so God's will is being revealed through the apostles who are endowed by the Holy Spirit to be able to speak authoritatively. And then there's prophets and there are those who have the gift of, Paul will say later, remember in 1 Corinthians, he says, because th the problem here is not with the gifts, but their attitude toward them, their, their abuse of them for their own self-exaltation, uh, uh, for their own self-advancement rather than the good of the body. And remember in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, if I have all knowledge, all knowledge, but I don't have love, it, it, it profits me nothing, right? It means nothing. And then in 1 Corinthians 8, he says, you know, knowledge puffs up. You know, th there are some who thought, well, I know it's okay to eat this meat offered to idols, and uh, I know there aren't real, these idols aren't real gods, and so there's nothing spiritual that's happened to this meat, you know, that makes it defiled or whatever. And Paul says, okay, you might have that knowledge, but that knowledge puffs up. It can make you arrogant. That was the, the problem where you're just, didn't, disregarding those who didn't have that understanding. And so uh, these were gifts he'll talk about later. And, and he mentions how they were. So you have all this language here. Um, he mentions down here, look at verse 7. You're not lacking in any gift. So they, they had the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Because Paul, remember, worked there for an extended period of time. Paul was in Corinth laboring among them. And we see in the book of Acts, the apostles could lay their hands on others and they could speak in tongues then. They could have the power of the Holy Spirit to exercise these gifts. And the, the writer in Hebrews says that's how the word is confirmed uh, through the gifts, through the signs, the powers of the Holy Spirit that were manifested among them gave them assurance of the truthfulness of the word. They were confirmed by these. So the problem is, since all of this was coming, notice this is all by, it's all the grace of God. These were gifts that were given to you. Seeing the problem was, was a lack of gratitude uh, on their part. You know, later he says in the book, he says in chapter 4 and verse 7, if all these things were given to you, why do you act like they weren't? Why do you act like, like, like these things are anything to your credit, like these, that, that this is your ability? or that you have a right to these things. You know, it reminds me of the entitlement mentality that is so pervasive in our culture, the lack of gratitude. You know, here it is November, Thanksgiving is coming up, and we sort of pay lip service to, uh, you know, we have this national holiday I'm very grateful for. It's a distinctly American tradition to set aside a time to give thanks. This sort of generic idea of giving thanks. Well, originally it was to give thanks to God not just to be thankful in some generic way, but to give thanks to God, to God. But we have this entitlement mentality. We're among the most blessed people, the most gifted people with more grace lavished upon us in this world, in this nation in which we live. And yet it's the most ungrateful, entitled, uh, whiny, complaining, protesting as though, you know, we're, as though it's just so terrible. If the people think it's so bad here, let them spend a few days overseas and live in different places, and I think they'd realize how blessed we are. Look, look at this great text from Chronicles. I wish, see, anything I write on the screen will be over the top of things I already had here. So I have to, I have to pull this stuff off. Sorry, I'm still trying to figure out a way to do that where I don't have to do all that. But I have this passage from Chronicles. This is when David is thanking God for the collection they took from among the people for materials for the temple. And David says, 1 Chronicles 29, 14, But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you. And of your own we have given you. When we put back into the treasury, it's, it's, it, that is what God has already given to me. And so sometimes we'll use that language when we take the collection. We say we're giving back 
from what God has given us. Verse 15, we're strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on earth are like a shadow. There is no abiding. O Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand. It is all yours. Right. So every good gift we have is because of God. James 1, 17. And uh, Peter says about these spiritual gifts, he said, these graces, he uses the same language, grace and gift. And he said, you're to be good stewards of those. You're responsible for what God gifts you to use his grace for his glory. So um, that's the attitude we ought to have. Even later in the letter in 1 Corinthians 15, um, when Paul says, I labored more abundantly than all the apostles. But he said, but you know, it wasn't me. It was the grace of God at work in me. For by the grace of God, I am what I am. Sometimes when people will compliment me and say, oh, you know, I love your classes or I love this or that. And I'll say, you know, it's, I'm trying to uh, be humble. I appreciate that. But I'll say, you know, it's by the grace of God, I am what I am. It's not to my credit, but that's to God's credit. Because whatever I can do is just because God's gifted me by his grace. I don't not, I didn't deserve to be able to do what I do. Whatever you do for the Lord, we're to be good stewards of it. And any thought or question on that idea that he's mentioning these things? That they need to have the perspective that these are gifts of God's grace to be used for the good of the church, for the glory of God. And it seems like instead they're taking them for granted. Does that make sense? Well, wait. So what else does he say, though? 943. This can't be so. So he says, you're not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. You remember I, in the introduction, I said one, one of the themes here is the imminent return of Jesus. That Paul said they need to live with the constant expectation that today could be the day that Christ will be coming. And so he mentions the day of judgment. He mentions the fact that we're going to stand before the Lord, that he's coming again. And he mentions the judgment several times when he talks about disfellowshipping that fornicator in their midst in chapter five, that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He keeps going back to that. I listed all those references that take you through the letter where that's a recurring theme. And you see this idea of it's not just that it's going to happen, but we're supposed to be living like we're like we're waiting for that. Like we're waiting. We're in expectation. We're we're desiring it. It's the idea. Philippians 3.20, we wait for the Savior from heaven. We're waiting for the Lord to return. He's going to come again a second time to those that wait for him. Second Peter 3.12, we're earnestly desiring the coming of the day of the Lord. Romans 8.19, the whole creation is groaning and longing for the day to come, for that day of consummation and restoration. Let me finish with this. It's the word, the word revealing is the word apocalypsis, or sometimes people will say it, I think incorrectly, apocalypse, but um, apocalypsis rather, but it's apocalypsis, but what what does that sound like? Apoc apocalypse. What is that? That's the very verse, first word in John's, the book of Revelation, the apocalypse of John. It's the revealing. It's the rep. So Jesus is going to come. He's going to be revealed. And Paul says, until that time, the Lord is able to sustain you guiltless in his sight. That's where I want to finish with this beautiful statement. Here, here's our last verse. Don't panic. You can leave then. But notice... He says, in Jude, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and I love this, it's one of my favorite doxologies in the Bible, present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. And he says, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. So he says, I know that God is able to keep you. You're waiting for that day to come. And God is able to keep you and sustain you. This is what we need. We're all sinners. We've all sinned. But when he comes, we can stand before him guiltless. Guiltless. 1 Corinthians 6, in chapter 6, he says, you've been washed. You've been sanctified. You've been justified. We're set right and our guilt is removed. That's what we need to be able to stand guiltless before the Lord in that day. 
And if we're faithful to him, Paul says, what does he say there in verse 9? God is faithful. He'll do it. If we're faithful to God, God will be faithful to us. God will be faithful whether we're faithful or not. But we'll be able to stand guiltless before him in that day. What a thrilling thought. What a thrilling thought. So I love all the theology we have just here at the opening of the letter. And that might be a record. Nine verses? Nine verses? Right. So we'll, 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 we'll keep, we'll, next time we'll try to cover at least ten. And then, ele- and then we'll keep trying to, I don't know, I don't know how long I could sustain that, but there's a lot here though, isn't there? Just remember, Tyler, all goals should be achievable. <laughs> good point, good point. I don't want to say I'm going to cover the next four chapters in the next class. It's an unachievable goal. Unachievable. John gave me the thumbs up, so I, that's okay then. Elaine, that, was that okay? All right, all right. Elaine, Elaine's happy.